All right, we're starting 20th century philosophy with someone from the 19th century, um, and that is Gottlob Frege. I always love that first name, Gottlob, um, who is probably the foundational figure for what is called analytic philosophy. One of the big trends that makes the 20th century distinctive in philosophy is a schism appeared between two different kinds of philosophy. And uh, those two are analytic on the one hand and what is called continental on the other. We do analytic philosophy. In fact, analytic philosophy is the kind of philosophy practiced in most of the English-speaking world. Um, uh, England, Australia, uh, particularly Australia, and um, Canada. Canada is a bit more continentally. They have a couple of figures who are uh, very well known who are sort of more continental influenced. Uh, the US, the US has some schools that focus on continental. For example, Marquette is, uh, has got uh, a big continental uh, tinge to its philosophy department. But in general, the English-speaking world does analytic philosophy. And that's what I'm schooled in. And the sort of uh, founding figure of the analytic school is this guy, Gottlob Frege. And of course, Bertrand Russell, who is much more famous than Frege, uh, including in his own lifetime, but who, who read Frege and was very influenced by Frege. Um, the Continental School, the, the difference between analytic and continental, briefly, analytic, uh, as its name implies, is very much interested in sort of analyzing concepts and ideas down to their component parts and looking at them very strictly and very carefully. It's very nitpicky. Um, continental, well, continental, the, uh, another difference between analytic and continental is analytic, the writing can be complex, as my first philosophy teacher, a guy called Anthony Grayling, put it. Um, the philosophy can be complex, a lot of little moving parts, but it sh each part should be clear. Clarity is a, a major goal of analytic philosophy, whereas uh, continental, if you read a sentence from a lot of continental philosophy, it's just full of jargon, full of kind of, uh, they like to do this thing with a slash in it and, and puns and stuff like that. And it's very hard for somebody who is not schooled in it to know what the hell they're talking about. It seems purposefully dense and off-putting and jargony to, to those outside. A founding figure of the continental school, another German speaker from the uh, 19th century was a guy called Husserl. So philosophy was sort of just philosophy up until the late 19th century when these sort of two figures paved uh, different paths and they have diverged more ever since. All right, Frege. Frege um, was primarily a logician and in fact one of his major contributions, perhaps his most major contribution, is he invented, more or less, modern uh, predicate logic. So if you take a logic class and you do predicates, um, that's owing to Frege. Now, you don't use the notation that Frege used. Frege had his own idiosyncratic notation. The notation that has become accepted is largely due to Bertrand Russell. But Frege was the first person to treat um, what Aristotle called categorical propositions that involve all and some and that kind of um, talk, like all men are mortal, you know, uh, all frogs are green. Now, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. That's uh, a categorical syllogism um, from Aristotle's time. Uh, that did not have a formal uh, uh, symbolism until um, Frege came along and Frege said that you can treat that in a way that allows us to combine categorical propositions with um, other kinds of 
logic like if-then statements. So now you have a way that you can say, if all men are mortal, then, you know, Socrates is a man. You can symbolize that all as, as one sentence. Okay, very important contribution. Uh, but Frege's uh, contribution that we'll be looking at is his contribution to philosophy of language. Uh, and in particular, we're, go we're looking at two articles of his. One, um, well, both of the, the ones that you're looking at were published in the 20th century in fairly, uh, very respectable philosophy journals. Um, for example, Sense and Reference is published in uh, the Philosophical Review, which is widely regarded as the best English language um, philosophy journal. Uh, but it was actually published decades before in Germany, in a kind of obscure journal that went out of business, uh, which was part of the reason why Frege's influence didn't really extend outside a small circle in his lifetime. But his writings were rediscovered and translated into English and became enormously influential in the 20th century. So Sense and Reference um, is published in Philosophical Review, and this thing called The Thought, which was published uh, in the teens, the, uh, like 1918 or something like that, um, in Germany, which was uh, in the tail end of Frege's actual uh, philosophical career, but then was translated and published much later in a journal called Mind, which is another famous English language journal. Okay, so we're looking at, at those two. Um, let's look at the thought first. Because if you take a logic class, on the very first day in the logic class, or at the first week certainly, you will be introduced to the concept of a proposition. And when uh, Frege uses the term thought, he is referring to what we normally call a proposition. Uh, what is a thought or a proposition? Well, it is to be distinguished from a sentence. A sentence is something that exists in the 3D world, the world that we uh, live in. A sentence is something that can be written down. You can count the number of words in a sentence. You can say this sentence is a long sentence. You can, uh, a sentence can, of course, be spoken or written. Uh, so you can hear a sentence or you can see a sentence, but it's sort of a, a thing that you can interact with. Um, but uh, there is something distinct from a sentence, which is the meaning of the sentence, um, let's say. So for example, think of translation. Think of a sentence in uh, English, like snow is white, and um, a sentence in another language, let's say French, uh, neige et blanche. Uh, is it blanc or blanche? I, I don't know if neige is masculine or feminine. I should learn that. I did know it years ago. Anyway, two sentences, one in English, one in French. Um, why is it that we say that it is correct, if you're translating from English into French, uh, the correct sentence to, uh, to end up with, um, if you start with the English sentence, snow is white, the correct French sentence to, to end up with is neige et blanche. What is it that these two very different sentences have in common? Obviously, it's nothing to do with the sentences themselves because they're very different. We say they mean the same. Okay, what does that mean? Now, meaning is one of the topics of philosophy of language, and philosophy of language is the, if you had to say what was the major contribution to philosophy of the 20th century, it's sort of an obsession with philosophy of language. Um, there's uh, writers on on philosophy in the 20th century have described philosophy taking a linguistic turn. There was philosophy of language before then. Uh, it just wasn't sort of at the center of philosophy. Locke has some philosophy of language. Uh, the ancient Greeks talk a little bit about language, but nobody goes into 
a, a huge exacting detail as they do in the, in the 20th century. And one of the key topics is this idea of meaning. What is it to uh, mean something? Now, an obvious suggestion is that the meanings of sentences are ideas in our heads. So the meaning of uh, an English sentence is the idea that it causes to arise in my head. Frege rejects this notion for a good reason. He rejects this notion because ideas in our heads are private. We, uh, we are incapable of telepathy at the moment. Um, so if the meaning of a sentence is an idea in someone's head, I would never know that you meant the same by a sentence as I do because I can never get at the ideas in your head. I can only ever get at the ideas in my head. Uh, and this is what he's talking about in um, the article, The Thought, where on page 299 he talks a lot about ideas. And he says four things about ideas. He says, ideas cannot be seen, smell, heard, or touched. Um, ideas are had. That is, he's saying uh, that we do smell things, we do hear things, but unlike what uh, the philosopher Berkeley said, it's not our sensations that we hear or smell or, or touch. Those are just evidence that we have heard something. Evidence that I've heard a sound is that I have an idea, an auditory idea, an auditory sensation, which is an idea in my mind. Evidence that I've seen a tree is that I have uh, a visual image that is an idea in my mind. But I'm not hearing or smelling the idea. I'm hearing or smelling the sound or the tree or whatever. Ideas are not he heard or smelled. They are had. You have an idea. And um, it, it's the evidence. It, if the idea is a sensation, which is a type of idea for all the, f um, according to philosophers before uh, Frege, uh, if you have a sensation, then there is evidence that you have smelled or seen or whatever. Frege is in this um, article, The Thought, doing a lot of stuff. One of the things he's doing is he's arguing against skepticism. If you've taken an early modern class, one of the first things you read is Descartes' Meditations, where you come across um, the skeptical arguments where he says, for all I know, I could be dreaming all of this because all I have access to is my my inner life, I just assume that it's caused by something outside my mind, but I can't know that because all I have access to is my inner life. It's sort of the idea behind uh, the matrix. You know, um, people in the matrix think that they're seeing things, but they're just having ideas caused by machines. So Frege is trying to argue against that. I don't think very successfully in this article, but his ideas um, that's what he means by a lot of the things that he's saying. We have ideas. We see things outside us. Now, ideas need a bearer. That is, ideas cannot exist except in the minds of um, people having them. You don't just have sensations existing by themselves. Sensations can only exist in people's minds. Uh, and every idea only has one bearer. So every idea, like uh, an idea is distinctive. Like my impression of a tree is only had by me. If you have an impression, even if it's of the same tree, let's assume, let's be realists and assume there is a real world and we're both looking at the same tree. Even if you have an impression of that tree, you don't have the same impression. You have an impression of the same tree, but it's not the same impression. It's your distinctive because you're standing in a different place. Or even if you were standing in exactly the same place, maybe, you know, I stand, look at the tree, then I move aside and you stand and look at the tree. It, suppose you have what looks like uh, uh, a, an identical impression. It's still not the same one because it's in your mind and my impression was in my mind. So for that reason, because ideas have all these features, they cannot be the meanings of things because meanings have to be public. Meanings are how we communicate. So we would not be able to communicate if um, 
our meanings were ideas. If the meanings of words, if the meanings of sentences were ideas in our heads, communication would be impossible. But communication is possible, so therefore meanings are not ideas in your heads. Well, what are they then? Well, the meanings of sentences are propositions. So when, as I, going back to the first week of a logic class, you are told that uh, sentences express propositions, and propositions are not sentences. Well, what are they? Well, for Frege, they're th these things called thoughts. Now, that is um, kind of a misleading title, because a thought sounds like something in your head. But uh, he um, tries to make an analogy in On Sense and Reference to illustrate that uh, these, the meanings that he's talking about are sort of in a middle ground between objective, uh, out there in the real world things, and uh, subjective ideas. Okay, so let's look at these distinctions that he makes in um, Sense and Reference. He says, first you have the sign. And by sign, he means literally like the scratchings on a piece of paper. So you have something written on a piece of paper. Let's say Hesperus. Uh, this is an example that he alludes to kind of briefly in Sense and Reference, but it is one of the most famous examples in all of 20th century philosophy. So people talk about this all the time. And this is uh, the, the, when we talk about Hesperus and Phosphorus. Okay. What are Hesperus and Phosphorus? These are the names the Greeks gave to Hesperus is the evening star, which is the last star visible, uh, sorry, the first star visible in the evening because it's so bright. You look up, uh, you know, it's, it's dusk, it's twilight, you just start to see stars. The first one that's visible is the evening star, Hesperus. And then in the morning, the last star to disappear when the sun comes up is the morning star, or phosphorus. Well, the Greeks didn't know this, but it later emerged that both of these things were not in fact a star, they were the planet Venus. Okay, so the Greeks talked about Hesperus, the evening star, they talked about phosphorus, the morning star. What they didn't know is that they were one and the same thing, which is the planet Venus. Okay, so the sign, the word Hesperus, written, let's say, here it is, written, that's a sign. Okay, now what does it, uh, that sign, of that sign you can say various things. First of all, you can say that it has a referent. It refers to something. Yeah, um, once you give up on the idea that meanings are ideas in your heads, and, and obviously I think Frege's got a very good argument that you should because meanings have to be public and ideas in your head are necessarily subjective and private. Uh, the obvious suggestion for what a word could mean or what the meaning of a word or thing is, is the thing that it refers to. This is called, this idea that the meaning of a word is the thing that it refers to is called the denotative theory of meaning or sometimes uh, rather dismissively, the in quotes Fido, no quotes Fido theory of meaning. So Fido means Fido. That is, the word Fido means the dog, Fido. So uh, this idea, the, uh, this idea means literally, this, uh, this conception of meaning means that you can literally pick up the meaning of the word Fido if it's a small dog. You can pet the meaning of the word Fido because the meaning is literally the thing that it refers to. That's a very uh, attractive idea, and it is the idea behind logic, behind propositional logic and predicate logic, that um, every, uh, or, or that the certain parts of logical phrases uh, pick out actual things in the real world. Okay, so we have the sign, we have the referent. Now, the trouble with the denotative theory, so, so notice we've already dismissed uh, one theory of meaning, that meaning is ideas in our heads. Now, uh, Frege likes this, uh, this 
public theory of meaning, the denotative theory of meaning, but he has a problem with that as well. Um, the philosopher Leibniz um, had a principle that he said, um, when you, uh, it should be the case, if meaning is, if the denotative theory of meaning is correct, then you should be able to have a sentence and you should be able to take out a term in that sentence that refers to something and replace it with another term that refers to the same thing without changing the truth value of the sentence. So, for example, you could say Hesperus is actually uh, the planet Venus. Okay? That sentence is true. Now, according to this principle, you should be able to take out Hesperus and replace it with Phosphorus because Phosphorus has the same referent. And if the original sentence was true, then the resulting sentence will have the same truth value, will also be true. So intersubstitutivity of co-referential terms, terms that refer to the same thing as Hesperus and Phosphorus do, salva veritate, that is Latin for preserving the truth value. So if you start with a true sentence, you should end with a true sentence. If you start with a false sentence, you should end with a false sentence. You shouldn't change the truth value at all. Okay, this works for sentences like Hesperus is actually the planet Venus. Take out Hesperus, replace, uh, uh, given that Hesperus is actually the planet Venus, if you replace it with something that also refers to Venus, then it will obviously be true that that thing, Phosphorus, is the planet Venus. So it works. But it doesn't work for all contexts. That is, there is a certain number of um, statements that involve what are called propositional attitudes. These are psychological attitudes that people have to propositions. So, some psychological attitudes are not propositional. Um, I'm struggling to come up with one because actually people, I was going to say love, uh, but uh, there is a significant number of people who argue that love has a propositional uh, element to it. That is, it involves that uh, emotions have content, that they're about particular things. Um, so, I don't know, uh, feeling pain. Okay, feeling pain doesn't have a propositional aspect to it. You just either have a raw sensation of pain or you don't. But lots of psychological states have what is called content. That is, there is, they're about propositions. So, for example, an obvious case is believe. So, you don't just believe, you believe something that means something. So, your belief state has what is called propositional content. It is about something. Your beliefs are about propositions. So, um, suppose I were to say, uh, Socrates believes that Hesperus is the planet Venus. Suppose that's true, okay, then you should be able to take out Hesperus and replace it with Phosphorus and uh, according to this principle the, the statement should also be true. But it's quite possible that it won't be because maybe Socrates does know that Hesperus is the planet Venus but he doesn't know that Phosphorus is the planet Venus. So it's true to say that Socrates believes that Hesperus is the planet Venus, but false to say that Socrates believes that Phosphorus is the planet Venus. You know, obvious other examples would be Lois Lane believes that Superman is sexy, you know, take out uh, Superman, replace it with Clark Kent. Uh, the first one was true, the second one is false. Lois Lane does not think that Clark Kent is sexy. So, uh, it seems that this pr we have to reject this principle. Frege, part of what Frege is doing in Sense and Reference is trying to save this principle. And the way that he saves it is that he argues that in certain contexts, the, the referent of terms changes. So, in propositional, in normal contexts, the referent of Hesperus is the thing itself. 
the, which happens to be the planet Venus, is an object. But in contexts like uh, that clauses that follow propositional attitudes like beliefs, hopes, fears, those kind of things, so so-and-so believes that, everything after the that is called a, is a special kind of context which um, is sometimes called referentially opaque. Referentially transparent contexts are normal contexts where the, uh, the sign refers to an object. We know what it refers to. But referentially opaque, this is not Frege's term, this is the term of a later philosopher called Quine, who, will, he will, who we will encounter because he's very important. Uh, in those contexts, according to Frege, the referent changes. So given that the referent changes, we can no longer say that Hesperus and Phosphorus or Superman and Clark Kent have the same referent. So we're not allowed to replace one with another. They're no longer co-referential. Co so he saves this principle by making it the case that Hesperus and Phosphorus are not co-referential in these contexts. Superman and Batman, un, uh, Superman and Clark Kent are not co-referential in these contexts. In these contexts, says, uh, says Frege, the referent of a name changes from its usual referent, the thing, to what he calls its sense. Okay, the idea of a sense is Frege's contribution here. So he says that focusing, um, one of the things you find is that uh, I've said that philosophy in the 20th century is obsessed with meaning. Um, an awful lot of very important philosophy is focused on the meaning of the most simple aspect of language possible, which is a name, a proper name. Because one of the immediate problems with the denotative theory of meaning, the Fido Fido theory of meaning, is that huge chunks of language don't clearly refer to anything. Like, what is the referent? Obviously, we know what the referent of Venus is. It's a planet. We know what the referent of a hand is. It's an actual hand. But what is the reference of the word and? What is the reference of the word red? Huh. Well, if, you, uh, if you're Plato, you start arguing that there are actually existing things that uh, must correspond to properties like red or beautiful, and they are Plato's forms, which I hope you will have come across before. They're really existing things. So according to someone like Plato, he argues, well, yes, things like beauty and truth and red have reference too. They're just not reference that we can encounter in this normal world of ours. Um, now, if you don't believe in Plato's forms, then what is the meaning of the word red? It, you have to come up with an alternative theory. But, you know, putting that aside, what about words like and and then? They don't have reference, so how do they mean? So the denotative theory of meaning is, has problems right away. You, you, have, to set, you have to supplement it with, uh, with another account of lots of words in language. But the, uh, the denotative theory of meaning doesn't seem to even work for the most obvious uh, thing that it would work on, which is nouns, and, uh, and most, most easily proper nouns, because proper nouns refer to an individual thing. Um, so, uh, Frege is trying to, trying to save the project of logic, which is largely extensional. Okay, extensional means um, where you're just talking about reference. Intentional means where you're talking about uh, sense. All right, um, so I'll explain that. So, um, explaining the difference between intentional with an S, intentional and extensional, uh, think of um, dog. Okay, so you can think of dog as a concept, or you can think of dog as the, the set of things. So the extension of dog is simply all the dogs there are. 
it's so the extension is just a collection of things. Now, um, the ideal for logic is that it should be extensional um, because that is sort of that grounds it in the real world and it explains the link between language and reality. The, 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 the huge um, draw for the denotational Fido Fido theory of meaning is that it connects the world with language. Language is about the world and there's this simple direct connection. And the idea of logic is that logic should, uh, the, the statements of logic should say things that are unambiguous and clear about the world. So the goal is to make logic extensional. Um, whereas the intention of the word dog is dogginess itself. What is, what is it that makes uh, that makes all of the dogs dogs. And they're not the same. And Quine, uh, uh, Quine again, has a, a good illustration of this. He says, think of the terms creature with a heart and creature with kidneys. Uh, what are they? Renate and chordate is the, the words for those. Renate means having kidneys, chordate means having a heart. Those terms have the same extensions because every animal that has a heart also has kidneys and vice versa. I suppose you could, you know, after they've cut their heart out, but it means that naturally have these, these organs. So they have the same extension, but they don't have the same intention. And so that in itself does seem to create a problem for the denotative theory of meaning because if all there is to meaning is the things that the word picks out in the world, then renate and chordate have the same meaning because they pick out the same things. But they don't, so this is a problem. Or is it? Well, Frege doesn't see it as a problem. Um, and in fact, he makes a distinction between an intentional concept, which is sense, and an extensional concept referent. Okay, so back to this problem of uh, propositional attitudes. So uh, Lois Lane believes that Superman is sexy. Okay, um, it seems that this violates Leibniz's principle of the intersubstitutivity of co-referential term salva veritate uh, because you take out Superman, you replace Clark Kent, and it, it becomes false. But Frege says, no, not so fast, because I'm going to say it's a rule that the referent of terms when they're in propositional contexts that is following the word that, which has a propositional attitude before it, like believes or hopes or whatever. When you put a sentence, uh, when, when you're in that context after that that, the reference changes. So uh, Superman and Clark Kent are no longer co-referential terms. So you wouldn't expect um, it to to keep the uh, truth value of the sentence the same, replacing one with the other. So what is the referent of Superman in those contexts if it's not the person, if it's not the, the physical object out there in the world? Well, he says in those contexts, the referent of the word Superman is its sense rather than its reference. So it's the meaning of Superman. It's the Superman-ness. So um, when, when, uh, the, so when we're talking about the sentence, Lois Lane believes that Superman is sexy, she has, her belief is based on her conception of Superman, which is sort of the sense of Superman. It's not based directly on the thing itself. It's, uh, her belief has something to do with the way that she regards Superman, not directly referring to Superman itself. So it kind of makes sense that uh, in those contexts, the referent of the word would change. So making this distinction between sense and reference change, uh, solves that problem, or, or so Frege argues. So you can keep this valuable principle that he is committed to. Another problem, and this is the problem that he starts the article with, is 
identity statements. So, for example, an identity statement is something like this, where you say something on one side is in the sense of equals, is one and the same as, and something on the other. Now, if it's the same thing, then that is what's called, here are um, some terms that are going to crop up a lot in this course. They're distinctions. There's a priori versus a posteriori. These are what is called epistemological distinctions. Okay, epistemology is to do with knowledge. So um, these are epistemological terms. They're about what we can know. A priori truths are truths that we can know without having had any experience. So you could be in a sensory deprivation tank your entire life and know that A equals A or that 1 equals 1. Uh, actually, uh, it's uh, a big argument. Uh, most people, certainly in Frege's time, would say that the truths of mathematics are a priori. That is, you can know without experience that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Okay, whereas, of course, a posteriori means requires experience. So you can't know that, um, I don't know, lemons are sour a priori. You can look at a lemon, and for all you know, it could be the sweetest thing in the world. Did you know that lemons have more sugar in them than peaches? It's true, uh, but they're not sweet. So you don't know um, a priori that lemons are sour. That is a fact that is an a posteriori uh, piece of knowledge. Now, there's a related uh, concept, which is what's called semantic, to do with language and meaning and a, a related distinction, and that is between analytic truths and synthetic. Now, analytic means that you can tell something is true just by analyzing the words. So just by looking at the way this is constructed, you can work out, oh yeah, that has to be true. Whereas synthetic, um, you don't know from looking at it that it's true that A equals B. It would have to be something to do with exactly the nature of these statements, uh, uh, of what these refer to, that reveal that. So this is an analytic truth. This is a, a synthetic truth. This looks like you could know it a priori. This looks like if you knew it, it would have to be a posteriori. You would have to find that out. And finally, there's a metaphysical distinction Uh, between necessary and contingent. And again, these seem to line up nicely. Necessary, a necessary truth is something that has to be true, could not possibly be false. So again, the truths of math, math seem to be like this. It could not possibly be false that 1 plus 1 equals 2. Just not possible. So that's why you can know it without experience, because it's impossible for it to be false. You don't, uh, you don't have to find out that it, it just happens to be true. It has to be true. Whereas a contingent truth is one that it's true, but it could have been false, and maybe will be false tomorrow. Like, today is Monday. Uh, happens to be false today, but, you know, maybe it'll, be tr it'll certainly be true next week. Um, so that would be something like today is Monday would be a contingent truth, whereas Monday is Monday seems to be necessary. All right. Now, it seems that um, replacing, so if I say Hesperus is Hesperus, that seems to be an a priori analytic and necessary truth. But Hesperus is phosphorus, which is true. And also notice that if you're looking at the reference, these are identical because Hesperus refers to Venus and Hesperus refers to Venus. So this is like saying Venus is Venus. Hesperus refers to Venus, Phosphorus refers to Venus. So this is like saying exactly the same. So if you just look at the reference, these statements are exactly the same. 
But the trouble is, they appear to be importantly different according to these categories. This one appears to be an a priori analytic necessary truth, uh, certainly analytic, certainly a priori. Is it a necessary truth? Yeah, it's certainly, it seems to be all three of those. Whereas this one seems to be all three of these. And they're very different. They're important distinctions between them. Although um, the philosopher Quine that we've already encountered is going to criticize this distinction um, later on. OK, so um, how do we explain that? It looks like this, uh, if all we have to go on is reference, then the reference of these names are not capturing everything there is about these statements because this statement is an a priori truth, this statement is an a posteriori truth, yet if we just look at the reference, they're identical. So they're not identical, but refer they're identical referentially. Well, says Frege, that just shows that uh, Refer reference isn't the only thing that there is. You have to have the sense. Okay, so proper na even proper names, like Hesperus is a proper name, or, Superman, uh, or Clark Kent, or whatever. Proper names have both a referent and a sense. Now, what is a sense? Um, Frager isn't very clear on this. Some people would say, well, it's the meaning, or it's the concept. It's uh, according to Frege, it's what allows you to pick out the referent. So it's some kind of information that enables you to use the name to pick it out. Now later on, later followers of Frege will say, okay, it must be then a set of descriptions. And it must be enough of a set of descriptions to allow you to pick out a unique individual. So it can't just be a, uh, a heavenly body, because that, in the case of Hesperus, is not enough for you to locate the exact one. So, well, the meaning of Hesperus looks very close to the meaning of the evening star, if you sort of flesh it out and say, i.e., the one that you see first, in the light that you see first as it's getting dark at night. That sounds like the sense of, um, of the name Hesperus. Uh, so, Frege says that even proper names have a sense. Now, another thing that Frege is committed to is that sentences work like names. Sentences are like sort of complicated proper names. So just as a proper name has a sense and a referent, so do sentences. The sense of a sentence is the thought or the proposition. So the sense of a, uh, of a name is <coughs> information that enables you to pick out what the name refers to. <coughs> the sense of a sentence is what enables you to pick out what the sentence refers to. Okay, so what's the referent of a sentence? What's the referent of snow is white? It doesn't, I mean, I get what the reference of Venus is, it's the thing itself. What is it that the sentence snow is white refers to? According to Frege, the referent of a sentence is its truth value. And he means literally there is a thing, the true, that every true sentence refers to. So every true sentence has the same referent, a thing called the true, an abstract, abstract entity. Now, senses in general and meanings in general also have a reality that is kind of abstract. They're objective, but because remember, they can't be subjective. Uh, the meanings of sentences, because they have to be shared, uh, cannot exist in people's minds. So they have an objective existence. Um, but they are not physical objects. They're abstract objects. Now, that can sound a bit weird. That can sound about, uh, oh, you know, like magical powers. Or what are you talking about? And how is it 
that we can access? How is it that we humans can access them? I know how we can share access to physical objects because you can see a tree, I can see the same tree. It exists in the same space with us. You know, physics explains how we interact with it. But you're telling me there are these things that are abstract, that are not things you can stub your toe on, yet somehow we have access to them. He, said, uh, he talks about this in The Thought. Um, he says things like on page 308, the 307, he says, we apprehend a thought. He says, I'm going to use that word. We don't see a thought, uh, which is a proposition. We don't see a proposition. Uh, you see physical objects. We apprehend it. You don't have a thought in the way that you have a subjective conception. So remember, uh, when you're talking about Hesperus, you can talk about the sign, the word. You can talk about the referent, the thing, the planet Venus. You can talk about the sense, the, the first star that you see in the uh, first, uh, uh, you know, heavenly body that is visible in the evening that enables you to pick out the referent. And then there's your conception, which is what the little idea that pops up in your head when you think of Hesperus. This is purely subjective. This is the meaning part uh, where proper names have a sense, um, sentences have a thought. They're both on the same sort of level of reality. He says, we apprehend these things. Uh, another thing he says on page 308, although the thought does not belong to the contents of the thinker's consciousness, this is not the same as this, yet something in his consciousness must be aimed at the thought. So something in your mind must pick out the thought, must apprehend it. And he says, a thought is real, but it's timeless and unchanging. So um, propositions are real things. The meaning of snow is white is something we can apprehend, but it is not one and the same with our thinking of it. He says, if all humans died out, snow is white would be completely unchanged. It would still be true. Um, well, presumably it does depend on the existence of snow, but um, I, I don't know, necessary truths, certainly it would always be true, like, uh, uh, like uh, he s talks about Pythagoras' theorem. That's true, and it's true if there were, it would have been true if humans, if sentient beings had never evolved. Pythagoras' theorem would still have been true, because it's a thought and it has independent existence. He says, thoughts are by no means un unreal, but their reality is of quite a different kind from that of things. Their things are, you know, made of atoms. Thoughts or meanings are not. Quine, that guy again, doesn't like this idea of abstract objects. He has a very, um, he, say, uh, he says, this might have been him or Russell, I can't remember. Uh, Quine refers to an ontological slum. Okay, ontology is the study of what exists. So your ontology is your little uh, list of all the things that exist. For some people it includes Sasquatch, for other people it doesn't. They have differing ontologies. Quine had a pared down ontology. He, you know, like, like with Occam's razor, he says, I'm only going to believe in something if I have to believe in it, if it's needed for the best theory of the universe, which for Quine was science, modern science. And he says, I don't think we need these things, thoughts. That, to say that uh, if you have a theory that requires that there exist these abstract objects that you can't measure in any way, like in physical terms, then he says, I don't like that. There's a problem there. So Quine is going to try and get rid of senses. But Frege's, Frege is very much committed to them. Frege is opposed. Uh, one, one of the things that's driving Frege is he rejects this idea that math is sort of a human construct. He says, no, we didn't make math. We didn't produce it, we discovered it. Ma the truths of maths are eternal and they're outside of us. They're not, math doesn't exist in the minds of humans. Math exists, we 
can discover it, we can apprehend these things, but they exist outside of us. They have a reality. Numbers are, are another thing that are standardly called abstract objects. What is the number two? It's not any pair of things. It's not this. I'm representing the number two when I do that, but the number two has existence independent of us. Um, if you believe in the reality of numbers, you believe that the number two has always existed, doesn't change, uh, is unaffected by whether or not people are thinking about it. It just exists. And it's not something that is part of the physical universe. Physi uh, physical universe is stuff that you can run into, whereas the number two is different from that. Plato's forms, of course, are another kind of abstract object. Um, so abstract objects are, a, uh, are argued about. What abstract, whether there are any abstract objects, or if so, what abstract objects there are, is a, is a sort of metaphysical and ontological argument. So Frege is very much committing himself to the existence of meanings as things that we can apprehend, that we can contact. So, you might say that that kind of dilutes the appeal of, because we started out, he was trying to save this principle, which it seems like um, means that he's saving uh, the denotative theory of meaning, which is a very basic common sense. It says that, you know, there's the physical world and there's us, and when we talk, our words pick out things in the physical world and that's how they mean. That's very kind of down to earth. But then he says, and there's this whole other uh, realm of abstract objects, which is where the propositions live. Sentences exist in the physical world. There are, there are signs that you can measure. There, you can count the number of letters in a sentence. They exist in the physical world, but their meanings do not. Um, but you know, he's got a, a lot of good reasons for saying that. Uh, I mean, um, snow is white and neige est blanche, they don't really have much in common, but we say, well, one it means the other. Okay, why? Well, because they both express the same thought or proposition. That's what he would say. So, Frege, um, why is he the father of analytic philosophy? Because, uh, well, one of the reasons is because one of the tools of analytic philosophy was logic. Um, as we'll see, Bertrand Russell takes this idea and runs with it. That he says, natural language is sort of polluted with vagueness, and natural language is great, you know, for telling jokes, for making double entendres, for writing poetry. Cool. But when you want to talk about, when you want to express truths about the universe, you want them to be clear and unambiguous. And ambiguity is something that plagues natural language. Plagues, you might say, well, that's the advantage when you want to be poetical. You know, you want double meanings, you want things like that. But when you want to just say something unambiguous about the world, you need something pure. You need a pure language that is free of all of these features of natural language. And that, for um, Frege and Russell, and others who follow them is logic. And that uh, uh, captures truth in a clear way. If we can express all of the truths of the world in logical terms, it will be a huge step forward in clarity and it will solve a lot of the problems that natural language gives us. Um, and so it's sort of this goal of striving for clarity and um, clearing away muddled thinking. That is the goal of analytic philosophy. And as we'll see, in the early 20th century, it uh, became pretty, mu uh, pretty much a, a sort of mission of analytic philosophers to just slash and burn and get rid of all kinds of things, like the logical positivists, who we'll get to soon, um, wanted to get rid of religion as meaningless and uh, a lot of metaphysics, uh, certainly stuff like Plato. They wanted to get rid of that and say, oh, that's, that's crap. We want to, just the facts, ma'am. That's what we want from philosophy. That's sort of why Frege is seen as such a pivotal figure, because of his contributions to logic 
and because of the uh, the way that he writes. It's, it, it's hard reading, I, I think you'll agree, once you've read these two articles, but it is clear, there's lots of examples, it's clear what he's doing, uh, it's just a, it's a high level project, but he's, you know, laying out what he's doing kind of clear and in basic steps. That's sort of what analytic philosophy um, is about. Crudely, you could say analytic philosophy kind of sides with science, whereas continental philosophy sides with, continental philosophy says, no, you can't, it would be, it's a stupid idea to try and pair away uh, the ambiguities and the uh, vaguenesses of natural language. You should embrace them. You can't escape them. Um, that seems to be uh, the idea behind a lot of the writing in continental philosophy. Um, Okay, but the main thing you take away from uh, Frege is this distinction between sense and reference, between the thing that a name picks out, which is its referent, and what is con somehow contained in the name that allows you to pick out the referent. Uh, we, we will very quickly move on to um, different theories of names. For example, uh, before Frege, Frege objected to a lot of things that John Stuart Mill said. John Stuart Mill had theories about math that were psychologistic. That is, they were, uh, that he, he was committed to the idea that somehow logic and math are human constructs and that the laws of thought are basically uh, just descriptions of how our minds work and that logic is just a description of how we think. Frege says, no, that's bullshit. Uh, it doesn't matter how we think. There's a real world out there. And we, uh, when we're thinking right, we grasp, we're following the rules that exist independently of how we think. So he rejects um, Mill's view of psychologism, that uh, logic is somehow psychological, that it's, it, it's derived from our psychology. But he also rejects Mill's theory of names because Mill says, that names are just labels, that they have reference but no sense. They, there is no meaning to a name uh, beyond what it pick, picks out. It's just a, a label that picks something out. There's nothing built into it like it's sense. Frege rejects that. Uh, Mill's theory uh, gets its revenge, as we shall see, um, <coughs> particularly with a very influential philosopher, recently dead, called Saul Kripke. There you go, a very brief introduction to Gottlob Frege. <laughs>